What did I think of the show? I was thrilled to bits with it and very proud and very like, oh my God, we did it. We actually, watching that first episode through, I mean, yeah, me, Philly, and we'll watch it and go, oh, look at that animation. Oh, look at that model. Oh, look at, oh, that's rubbish. You know, but just taking it as a whole in a room full of people, it was like, oh, wow, we did something pretty special there. The hangover comes very quick where it's like, okay, now you've got to do it again and again and again and again and again and faster this time because, yeah, you had all that time to do the first one. Now you've got to start a production schedule because racing the clock from start to finish was about nine months. And then it's like, okay, now you've got to do, you, you've got to do an episode in 12 weeks. Okay, and after that, you've got to do an episode in eight weeks. And then they've all got to be eight weeks. In the first 12 months of production, we had 17,000 system crashes. 17,000 system crashes. I remember that number. I remember it very well. We literally had vendors telling us, you can't do what you're trying to do. Like, our software is not designed to do what you're trying to get it to do. You should stop doing that. I mean, the great thing is, I don't think people realize how much Canada has uh, given to the software for the whole industry. Because you had Montreal companies like Softimage, that was the foundation of the industry. We'd had a very good, <laughs> sometimes contentious relationship with Softimage, where you know we would send them bug lists because we we were pushing the software more than anyone else in the world combined, and they were fixing the bugs as we went along, and and they'd come and visit us and watch what we were doing and say oh my God, I can't believe you're doing this. And, and so there was a lot of back and forth with them. Softimage had so many bugs in it. Yes. It was, uh, it would just kill us every day. And we, our partner at the time was Alliance. And there was a gorilla there called Stefan Reichel. <laughs> and he was called the polar bear because he was white haired. And I was called the grizzly bear. And we used to have these fights, just screaming at each other. And they, they were in trouble because they'd done a tax credit on Reboot and things like that, and it had to come out. And I remember a meeting where they went, well, why don't we just go to I-11 and get them, get them to do it? And I went, well, how much money have you got? And mm -hmm. I don't think they can, because nobody's done this before. We are specifically set up as a pipeline to do lots of animation. And I said, the trouble we've got is the software keeps bugging it. So he says, right, I'm going to go and talk to the software guys. And he went to the software guys and I loved Stefan so much. And the head of Softy Marsh says, to be quite honest with you, Stefan, most of the people here think it's impossible what Ian's trying to do. And he went, what do you mean? And he went, I'm telling you, he's not even gonna get an episode done. And he had a finished episode in his pocket. And we'd got quite a lot of the other episodes. And he went, so you don't think that's possible? And he just let them hang themselves. And went, I think Ian knows more about your software than you do. Watch this. And they all watched the first episode of Reboot. And that was the end of it. Does a show go out with a bit of dodgy animation in it? Yes, it does. Um, does, does the first episode go out and Bob doesn't have an ass? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'll, never, I'll never forget the shot. I think it's in the tearing where Bob goes to Megabyte's tour, rings the doorbell, he invites him in, and it's a back, low back shot of Bob walking into the darkness. And he has no ass, because the modeler didn't give him an ass. There were so many things we didn't have time to fix. And he, I, but I remember Ian saying, give that man an ass for the next episode. So quickly, Bob was, I think, Phil, I think, took him, it called him up and re-sculpted his glutes so that in the next show, he had an ass, so yeah. There was a very steep learning curve. And getting through that first part of the first season was what well, we all knew it was make or break. So we, we were totally determined as a group to get through it. The first thing that really blew my mind was a shot that Phil did. And I think it was before we were in full production and it was, it was a hex coming down the stairs in her lair, talking to Bob. I remember, I remember the first time he did a hexadecimal walk. He had her walking down steps. It was a very seductive walk. It was very technical the way he had done it, and it was clever. And it's like, God, I never, I would have just bashed keys till it looked half decent. She looked amazing, and it, it was played back in the edit suite, which was sort of this professional grade, beautiful, crisp color monitor. And it just looked phenomenal. Everybody who saw that footage, because we, we showed it, you know, it was part of the tour when we showed people, 
Everybody just went, what is this? Because <laughs> they'd never seen anything like it before. And that sticks with me to this day. Phil's the secret weapon. Phil saved us so many times. He was always sort of like the man of the people. He was really easy to approach and really uh, personable and, and helpful. It was like totally formative for me working with Phil. We were trapped in a small room. He smoked like a chimney. I'm sure it took many years off my life. <laughs> but, uh, but no, being his assistant was, was fantastic. Taught me so much about production and animation. They were, they were pretty, pretty good about communicating to us that, that we were falling behind. We all knew it was coming. We knew we had to catch up. We had three weeks to do this thing. The Medusa bug in the first season, it was specially written to um, reduce animation. Everybody turns to stone. Right, so we don't have to animate as much. Um, I don't know if that really saved us or not. I think for the entire time, Steve Ball was sat at a computer with a shot of mainframe and turning it to marble, like just painting frame by frame, sweeping across the city. Um, and I think that was his gig for like that entire episode. This was like a technical thing for me because I'm not the, wasn't the most technical guy. So basically they wanted this binom to like fall into cubes. And I was like, I have no idea how to do this. I just messed around and I, I, I think the way I did it wasn't the proper way, but it worked really well. And I think Ian, I think Ian set me up to fail. I think he was trying to sort of see where I was at and I nailed it. And it was kind of like, he's like, because he's like, well, how'd you do that? Because <laughs> he didn't know how to do it. And I was like, yes. That was, I think, the episode that I was up for four days straight, animating around 25% of the show, I think an hour nap in those four days. And it got so bad that I was hallucinating and was told to go home. <laughs> probably wish I did less, because I think we could have probably, some of, the, some of the work in there might have suffered a little bit. It was a lot of fun. She was like, you know, the character that I modeled. I modeled her lair. I modeled herself. So I did have a bit of a close connection to her. I really enjoyed her as a character. Comes a time in every day where I have to take over because the older guys have uh, sometimes got to take a nap and I have to hold the fort down. Worked solid through at night, slept for a few hours under my desk, got up and, and kept going. Uh, but it didn't, you know, it didn't bother me. You know, there's been some talk about from some people about sleeping under the desk. That was definitely something I did on that show. Cardboard on the floor and sleeping under our desks and not seeing loved ones for long periods of time and missing birthdays. And I never did five days, I don't think, like Ian did, but I'm pretty sure I was there for three days without going home for that episode. But that's that was all hands on deck, right? It was just everybody throwing themselves at this thing. They need lots of animation down in a very short period of time. So anyone who uh, showed some promise they took on. Yeah, I was doing the Vancouver Film School's uh, animation program. Dropped out at, <laughs> at 18 and was, yeah, working at, uh, at Reboot at 18. I knew I would learn more in the first couple of weeks there than I would for the rest of my program. So I left my program early. It was a little harder to work in the States afterwards because I didn't actually have my certificate. At the time I was thinking, oh, I don't even, that piece of paper, I don't need that. I, I found my job, I'm, I'm where I want to be. The, the day I first walked in was a Monday, bright and early on, on Monday, and uh, there was this mountain of pizza boxes. Oh, so that was from Sunday night. Okay, so everyone, people were here on Sunday night, really late, I guess. Okay, well, there's that. What I used to do was I'd, I'd say to my assistant, Mark, Mark Lemon, uh, I'd say, okay, I'm gonna work late, set a bunch of renders going, I'll leave you a note on the desk with their names, and when you come in in the morning, offload them to the edit suite. And he'd be like, okay, and he'd go. And I'd work, and I'd set all the, I'd render all the renders, and, blah, blah. and then I'd just like, uh, I'd just roll under the desk for a nap. And I'd just be lying under the desk having a nap. And the, the next thing I'd know was Mark had come in, sit in my chair, look at the note, start offloading things, stick his legs out and kick me under the desk. It was just more work than anybody expected. And it got tiring, but it was, looking back on it, uh, it was great. The place just was brimming with energy. But we worked ourselves to death. We were there all the time and we loved it. Most of the time. I don't like uh, expected overtime because I think expected overtime just means that things haven't been planned properly. That's all it is. Uh, but this wasn't, I mean, Everything was new. Like we, 
we were really developing all of our tools that we were working with. The software that we were using was was extremely new. Um, so there was a lot of development in that, and we all understood that. So it's like it's not like you go to a company that's been established for like a decade and you're walking in and you know at that point everything should be working smoothly. But with this, everything was, and we all understood that, and we all put in that extra bit of effort just to try and get everything done. Barely getting it done. Yeah, and there's some some uh, shots where if you you watch the shows and you're like, eh, the sound seems out of sync there. That's because the renders weren't finished. We we were mixing the sh and the yeah, scenes okay. wouldn't be finished, sure. and they're like, don't care, just put in a blanket explosions. <laughs> Chris Broff would come to the studio. He would listen, and he'd go, yeah, that's that sounds good. Or he'd say, you know what, I want to hear the dialogue more here. Okay, no problem. Do the dialogue. It goes great. Just print it. I got to get on a plane. I need to go. We were so down to the wire that we had runners fly tapes to LA. If we failed to deliver, it was a $50,000 fine. I rented a Learjet yep. to save the 50 grand, because the Learjet back then was maybe four grand, yep. to fly to LA. And I mean, to show you how crazy things were, we got there like, like four minutes before the thing had to go up on the satellite bird to New York to start broadcasting. I mean, literally, we got there an hour before the thing was going on the air. That's how tight it was. We had Alliance, we were in business with ABC on a number of projects. And when you fail to deliver to a broadcaster, they get very angry. At the time, we thought it had unbelievable potential. We knew that we would not get any of our investment back if we simply shut it down. So we chose to kind of double down and uh, and eventually, of course, Alliance uh, was 50-50 partners with the management team at Mainframe, the creators of Reboot. I'm thinking this is, a, I'm just coming in, it's latchkey. And meanwhile, it was total reinvention at the at the end of the day, because once we had those four, first four episodes, and then we had to take it off air after Medusa Bug, mm -hmm. and we we're gonna do little teases with bumpers with them. Yeah, we did. We, we, did we tweaked the yeah, ending tweet. and the virus came back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jenny Trias was head of children's at ABC and she was our master, but she was also our champion. She agreed with Ian to go along with this delay tactic to buy us more time to finish the episodes that were in production. Because she'd seen the viewing figures, she'd seen the fan reaction. Systems, peoples, and cities to this place. Mainframe. Oh, Bob, did you really think that only Hexadecimal could create a Medusa bug? You'll soon find out that hers is quite inferior to mine. Once Mainframe is offline, who knows which systems might be next? <laughs> she could have played hardball and just sued us, or, and the show would have gone into reruns with no explanation very early in its run. Um, but she didn't, she chose to go along with the creative solution, the more fun solution. And uh, which is why, yeah, we came up with the whole Trias effect and things in in her honor. The virus is downloading my door as we speak. I'll be right over. No time. Besides, I need you to search and find the Trias effect. Trias effect? Yes, only that can stop. Oh, oh no. Now what am I gonna do? I was very happy that that decision was made because we were really under the gun on delivering the next few episodes. So to get those extra two, three weeks of production time so we could catch up and get the shows done uh, was fantastic. I ended up going out to Vancouver for an afternoon panel and Jenny Trias from ABC was there. A guy from the bank stood up way at the back and said, you know, there's big issues with the production in terms of deliverables. And I'm like, yes, I understand. I understand that, I'm at the network, yes. Well, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. Well, you sue them for breach of contract. The thought of that was just like heresy. Like, why would I do that? That'd be like poking a puppy with a sharp stick. Like, he said, well, what are you gonna do if they don't deliver? I said, wait. I said, we'll play this thing till the oxide falls off the tape. There will be no viewer fatigue. It is that visually scintillating. It is that important. No worries about them being late. We'll be patient, we'll wait. 
because the next stuff will be even better. But in that break, that's when every single script is rewritten. Yeah. Everyone is rewritten to work in because you had the epiphany moment following it's the this this is live action this isn't cell animation yeah and that's once that happened all the scripts turned into live action written scripts not animated scripts they kept doing things abc kept doing things because that was the way they did it like we'd send them the voice records and they'd get somebody we didn't ask them to do it they'd get somebody to beat out the dialogue because that's what you used to do when you were sending animation away overseas so you had a division at abc whose job was to on the on these big sheets the big sheets this tall look like giant excel spreadsheets and they paste they sit there with a stopwatch or a frame counter and they count up you know if, if bob says hi dot how are you and they write hi dot how are you hi is this many frames dot is this many frames there's the d and they beat out the whole script on these beat sheets and sent them to us. So this is a pile of paper this thick, giant sheets this big. And we're like, what are these for? And it was the same with storyboards. We didn't really use storyboards. We, in the first season, we had Dick Zondag in-house. And if we had a big action sequence, like the race in Racing the Clock, because that's action, he would storyboard that out. But we didn't need storyboards for dialogue. The TIFF, yeah. there's a scene yes. in the TIFF where Bob's working on his car and Enzo calls him on a vid window and Bob's under the car. And the guy was in the storyboard, storyboard room and he's painstakingly storyboarding that scene with a camera move here's on the vid window that moves down to fit. And by the time he'd finished storyboarding the scene, you had it in the Avid I, animated. I, 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 and it's like, and that was the point where Chris Brough you showed that to, you showed him the scene and then you showed him the storyboard and he's like, what's the deal? He's like, I did that while he was doing that. And he's like, we don't need this, do we? Can you draw what's difficult, like a stunt or something, come up with some gags and things like that. I don't need you to do two people talking in a diner because I've got that ready to go. It's just, yeah. So I'd leave them, go away, come back and say, what have you done? And he goes, well, I did them talking in a diner. Top of my head used to come off. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were just three guys from London who'd never made a TV show in our lives, who used to animate logos. And we were coming into, in this instance, Vancouver, where there were a lot of companies in town who made animated television shows. And we were walking in going, okay, this is how we do it. And they were like, sure it is, kids, yeah. And there was a lot of that initial pushback, and then we get mad, and then they get mad, and then there's a fight, and, and then you meet in the middle. And then you show them what you've done, and they go, oh, I get it now. And they, I think, could see the future coming and go, okay, we need to retool and re-change the way we think to move forward into this bright new world of CG, and now look where Vancouver is. In the 90s, in, in the animation business in Hollywood, animation was really looked down on by the rest of the entertainment industry for the most part. It's kind of like, oh, you do movies, then if you're not good enough, then you do TV live action, then if you're not good enough, then maybe you do something else. And then animation was way down on the bottom. And we had a lot of writers that would be coming through and their dream was to become a live action sitcom writer. I'd get these writers coming in and they're just like, sorry, I'm just kind of here, just doing it, I'm trying to get a real job. And I'm just like, I love kids animation. Like, I don't know, I, I felt disrespected, you know? And it, like, I thought it was a great honor to work for kids. I mean, we're like forming people's brains for the future. When I first started, like maybe my second or third year, and I watched these cartoon shows made for kids, and it was that kind of sitcom -y humor where they were putting each other down. And I thought that was worse than all the violence or the physical goofy gags that they were doing, like the roadrunner running into the wall. You know, it's all these Senate hearings, like, oh, if a, if a character runs into a wall, that's dangerous for kids. And I was thinking, honestly, if your own friends are putting you down and not supporting you, I think that's more dangerous for kids. That's just me. So I would just quietly, subversively try to write my characters so that they loved each other and that if they were really friends, yeah, they could annoy each other, they could want to kill each other. But at the end of the day, they were never like, cut each other out or hit below the belt or cut them off at the knees because I felt that was also important to program kids or to, you know, 
to get that message out. I had gone to VFS and taken uh, script writing. At the same time, I'd met a bunch of computer animators locally in Vancouver, uh, Jimmy Hayward being one of them. I used to hang out there and just do free writing for them. I said, if you ever need any writing, I, I need experience, you know. And they told me, oh, there's this new company named Mainframe opening up in Vancouver, and they're, they're going to do a CG TV series. So this was a big deal. And uh, I said to Jimmy, can you get me a copy of the show Bible? I want to write, I want to try writing a spec script. So he did. He, he gave me a copy of the show Bible, and I read it, and I, I wrote a spec script, uh, which was the great brain robbery. I said, here, you know, can you get it to somebody important? He did pass it on to Lane, and Lane read it and liked it, and I, I was off and running. I couldn't believe it. Bob is going to shrink down, fly inside my head, and battle hack and slash for control of my brain? Basically. Cool. BSNP, or Broadcast Standards and Practices, is a thing that I guess all networks have. Uh, we're only familiar with the uh, ABCs. They always would say that, you know, we're here to protect the children. And it's like, no, you're not. You're there to protect the network from being sued when a child sees something in a TV show and copies it and gets hurt. Is certain amount of danger bad for kids or good for kids? And ABC at the time took a very strict rule of like, we don't want to see broken glass ever. So I don't think that's bad for kids to see personally, but uh, they did. A lot of times though, it would be silly where you'd be looking at it going, why isn't this allowed? This doesn't make any sense. Well, we always had Mary, whatever her name was. Mary Conley. Love Mary Conley. Which I, I used to watch, I, I used to eat popcorn and sit, sit in the cheap seats watching the game going on. And the ones I do like, MC rejects. Really, Ms. Matrix? There's gonna be children in the audience. I'm afraid I can't approve of this one. Ian just simply would say no. And you never said no to standards and practices. Well, I loved standards and practices. I don't. I've got nothing bad to say about them. Nothing good either. That's not true. I think every time um, Ms. Connolly stopped us doing something, what we came up with made the show better. And I think he's saying that really nice right now because those were some of the most contentious conversations that we had. <laughs> Over and over again. <laughs> but I but I appreciate it. I know. Is that let's go back to the very first episode with the tires. Remember when the, the car goes oh, yes. over? <laughs> go on. We have so, the tires jumble blanket. Remember we, what happened was that so we have a car they crash. Crashed through the the car crash, no, the car it goes over a wall. Yeah. And it goes over a wall and because it disappears over the wall, we said we don't know if he's alive or dead, we have to do something to show he's alive. And they added tires flying up in the air to show they landed on tires. Yeah. And that made it approved, or else they wouldn't approve the scene. God, I remember the explosions that we had to do for that. And broadcast standards and practices made us do little white expanding <laughs> spheres. That was it, no explosions. Glitch, safety line. We couldn't have Bob dive through a stained glass window. Glitch, BSNP. And it's like, oh, okay, so we'd have to have Glitch dismantle the stained glass window so Bob could go through it and then it would reassemble. In the prison game, Dot's got the giant guns. Initially, they were just guns. And BS and people were like, you can't have guns. And it's like, but it's a prison game. They've got to have some sort of weapon. And Ian went, okay, okay, make the guns huge, but they shoot bubbles that capture the prisoners. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's great. So then we have all these, you know, Ian's like, yeah, OK, when she fires the gun, it makes a really big flash and a really loud noise. And it's like something out of John Woo, but it just shoots bubbles. There was property of broadcast standards on the inflatable raft somewhere. Yes. Who knows what ended up in the show and what didn't. We tried so many things. There's a YMCA parody called PSP, and it was brilliant. Yeah! Everyone was laughing like crazy, you know. It's like that one was the first, you know, real poke. Yeah, the worst note I got from Mary was that we were promoting incest. That was like, what? <laughs> yeah, Dot singing to Enzo was promoting it. And I just lost it on that one. We were tasked with building 
just generic buildings to fill out uh, Bodway and parts of mainframe. Ian liked some of the stuff we were doing, but we were it didn't have, I think, quite the visual impact he wanted of like the skyscraper window patterns. He threw that to Phil late one night, like we need some proper bright windows that we can map onto buildings. I'm sure it was given to Phil at like two or three in the morning. You could hear the keyboard probably from four offices away. Uh, chain smoking, pounding on the keys, metal music blaring in the background. Nobody hit a mouse button as hard as Phil. You could always tell when Phil was in one of the suites working because you could hear like whack, 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 whack when he hit the mouse button. Supposedly, he basically typed in dots and dashes that made up F U, F U, F U, <laughs> and put that into the window patterns. You broadcast standards in binary code in the windows. <laughs> if you can stop it on the right frame yeah. and work it out. And, and we didn't know. It. And we didn't know. We found that after the fact. Give me one good reason why we can't put this guy in the show. We used to get trainees as an exercise, like to, to train them up on the system. We'd get them to build models and we'd say, build a binome. The first couple of shows, there aren't that many binomes. The, the idea with the binomes is they're the zeros and the ones that make the machine run. And in the beginning, to save animation and save modeling, they were all gonna be identical. And then very, very quickly, uh, they all started to develop personalities. And it's like, you know, okay, this guy's a construction worker because he builds things for Dot, and this guy works in a diner, so he's a chef. So very quickly, you know, a trainee would build a binome in a toque toque. Well, we put tons of stuff in the show, so this is a band called Toque. Yeah, they're like a hockey-based band. So they been, the song's like four minutes for roughing, that later our hockey game was called Toque Army. So I was the lead singer for a little bit, and I was in art school. But then I decided to go tree planting, so they fired me and got somebody else. They really started off with being sort of generic characters. They were sort of background fodder for, you know, occasional gag here and there. But as the show progressed, they started getting bigger and bigger roles, and some, you know, lead characters would be, would be binomes. I always liked Hair Doctor. Everything is going according to plan, your enormity. And then the whole rain gag with my digits. <laughs> my digits! I, I created Fingers, the doctor. Old Man Pearson, which was the junkyard guy. Let me go, you tin man! I created these little mechanical eyebrows over his one eye. Cyrus. It makes me smile, sir. I got to model him, so I have a certain connection to him. I liked him because he was a little Weasley guy. Captain Capacitor was not just a generic binomial, he was a main character. Hi, Cold, I love me job! <laughs> He was a pirate, duh, obviously. And I think Long John had done something. He might have played Captain Hook or something like that in a play. Such clumsy boys, butterfingers. And we Brits, the, the hub, were like, Long John Baldry, because we grew up listening to his music. And it's, he was a star, you know, it's like, oh my God, Long John Baldry. And then we found out he was a local actor. So, Wham bam, there he is, and he and he pulls off this amazing pirate voice, and it was we we couldn't be happier. I did build the saucy mare. I was button heads with Ian on this one. He wanted the sails to float. I'm like, well, it needs to attach to something. And he goes, no, it doesn't. That was the first drawing ever. I, sometimes drawing small was just not working for me, so I'd get out this big pad and just make shapes and that was the first one right there. I did some texturing, I did the, the skull logo for the Saucy Mare, our original, uh, which I cleaned up and <laughs> we put it into Photoshop 2, 2.0, <laughs> <laughs> and created, it, created the actual texture that went on there and then that got mirrored onto the sails. That's a very old die sub of the, of the, the drawing right there. It was a huge, like physically, like in the digital world, it was very large. I just built it to what looked correct, right? And uh, yeah, it didn't take into account of staging at all. Bob was fixing his car and there's this song that he's singing and it's still, I still hear it in my sleep. <laughs> that one scene played 
10 bajillion, gajillion times in the first week that I worked there, and it's imprinted on my brain. And that production was continued over Christmas. We were behind schedule on the show, and everybody had to, you know, it's Christmas, I'm going home. And so people started leaving. A lot of the crew had come from Toronto because of Sheridan, and there was more schooling in Toronto for animation. Uh, they all went home. I think we got down to like five or six people and we still had 18 minutes of the show to do and like a week and a half to do it. But Ian gave me a certificate saying, you'll never have to work on Christmas Day again. <laughs> <laughs> Which I would show him every Christmas for the next five years. <laughs> you want a script to be about a page a minute. So a 21 minute show should be a 21 page script. It never is. So I think our average scripts would have been 35 pages long. And Wizards Warriors was a 52 page script for a 21 minute episode, which is just, and it was full of stuff we couldn't do. There was an animated hedge maze in there. Like there's a bot where they end up in a hedge maze and the hedge comes to life and it grabs them with tendrils of, and we're like, we can't do tendrils. What are you, are you crazy? Ian was just like, to hell with it, just record the whole thing, all 52 pages, we'll put it in the Avid and we'll cut something together. And they realized that there was like 22 minutes of dialogue, which left absolutely no room to do anything visually. Ian just decided to ignore the script. He was just gonna make something up that used all the same sets and characters and the basic idea of the Dungeons and Dragons theme, but the script <laughs> was out the window. And he came up with the idea of the gauntlets for the levels. So we'd take okay, this thing that happens on this level is quite fun, but we don't have time to get there, get in, get out. We don't, there's just not enough plot time for that. So we'll just do a series of vignettes, which was easier for chopping up for animators, you know, so you could have one guy doing all the gauntlets and another guy does the bit where they're just standing on a pinnacle in a black void with a camera going around them. That's one animator, give that to one animator. You're just breaking it down into moments. So you, the beginning works and the end works and the stuff in the middle will just busk it and make stuff up and lose the hedge maze, but throw in the battle carrots. Oh my God, the battle carrots. I, okay, the battle carrots are mine. So I'd forgotten. Wow, yeah, yeah, that's me. There were a lot of things mentioned in the script that were never seen. The scene where Enzo is on the giant banana going, fire-breathing skull beat fits right in with shadow worms, living rock piles, killer puddles, haunted laundry, battle carrots, armored... Watch out! That line obviously is from the script, but in the script you never saw the battle carrots. So Ian's like, we're gonna see the battle carrots. So, boom, battle carrots. Glitch cutters. I think he stole glitch cutter from uh, Quick and the Fed. Glitch cutters. You have to declare that when you do that and pay the actor and things like that, but he did it. He, so he, he nicked lines from places to help it, to help the narrative flow. So it's like, okay, we've got the battle carrots, he's gonna chop them up, we need glitch cutter, but we don't have it. Pinch it from another episode and pay the money. Stay frosty, stay frosty. So I watched way too much TV as a child and my family would say, you watch too much TV. And then when I got hired at 17 making TV shows, I was like, <laughs> like I guess it's gonna pay off for me. When I watched too much TV, all the ads, one of the things they would always do is they'd say, free for only $9.99. And I was like, it's not free. Why are they saying free? Because it was always for shipping and handling. And you're like, that's a lot. They're pay you're paying a lot for handling, you know? So with Mike, the TV, that was our chance to sort of uh, make fun of the stupid, TV can be so stupid, you know? And Mike was sort of this horrible concentration, this aggregate of everything that's dumb on TV in one spot. But wait, there's more. Act now, and we'll port you the handy logomatic absolutely free for only 99 99 Lane and I were always looking for TV shows that he could jump up and announce that were really annoying. And uh, I don't know, maybe I suggested um, a soap opera, like a really horrible soap opera. And Lane came out with The Love Hospital. The Love Hospital. Your prescription for romance. Oh, Love Hospital, that was Jono for sure. <laughs> really? Oh, maybe it was then, okay. Yeah, you're just in, you know, when you're with a good team, you just have a good jam. And Jono and I had some of the best jams 
Wizards, Warriors and a word from our sponsor, I think would have to be my favorite episode from season one. A lot of my favorite episodes from Reboot were not just because oh, it's a good script or a good story or a fun episode. It's because of what went into making it. We'd wrestled control of so many things that were fighting us to do with production and, and, and modeling and animation and just technical things and creative things, the scripts getting out of control, blah, blah, blah. Um, that was when we managed to get all the toothpaste back in the tube and we had control of what we were doing. And from that point going forward, I think we got the ship on course from that point. And it's a great show. It's a fun show. And there's a lot of great memories when I watch it. It's pretty mind blowing, you know, it was like, it was like looking into the future. It was like this brand new thing. I was used to like, I don't know what, 16 bit video games or whatever. And then this comes out and it's like, wow, you can, you can just see where things were headed. I don't watch, I would say 95% of the stuff that I do, but I did watch Reboot. I mean, it was aimed right at me. You know, I was the demographic there, so. Alphanumeric! Oh, we were so stupid with Enzo. We were so, anybody with any sense would have cast a female actress to do a little boy voice. And that voice would have stayed exactly the same throughout the entire run of the show. But no, did we do that? No, we said, no, we want a real kid. We wanted that authenticity and we got it. And bless them, we had some fantastic actors. Jesse Moss was amazing, but he grew up. I remember it. <laughs> At the beginning, I was just kind of like, oh, no, it's just cold. No, 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 like, I'll, I'll be fine next week. And then next week, my voice would be a little deeper, <laughs> you know? And then I'd be like, no, 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 trust me. And then and finally, they, they just kind of pulled the plug. They, they said they, they couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, it was, it was a sad day. Did we learn? No, we cast another kid and another kid and another kid. If you look at the, se the early season one model of Enzo, he's quite a primitive model. When we got better at doing what we were doing, we improved the model. And it's like, well, how do we hide the improvement? How do we do the transition? And that's where the whole birthday idea came from. So at times when you're really running behind deliveries and you're looking at the expected completion date of an episode, you would often fall back to what you describe as a bottle show, which is you have the characters introducing the idea of remember when and you're basically just using clips from all the other shows to build. You know, you're involved in a 24 minutes of something with maybe five, six minutes of new stuff. Talent Night was supposed to be a bottle show. It was supposed to be a bunch of characters, maybe five, six characters, the humans and some binomes, get trapped in the diner in a data storm. So you can't see out the windows, it's just shash. So they're trapped in the diner. And Enzo's like, oh, but it's my birthday. And then they decide to put on a, a little impromptu show in the diner for Enzo's birthday. Bottle show, super simple. And we end up with this building a giant stage with roadies and things, and then all these different acts that come on the stage. Our bottle shows are crap. It's Our bottle shows are terrible. They're, they're worse than a normal show to animate. Yeah, because the problem with them with the bottle show is they do everything new. And that's yeah. not the purpose of a bottle show. It's supposed to use old animation to save time and money and they refused to reuse anything. Yeah. Yeah. But we did, we did kill the Dice Trick characters in that. We did. And I mean, the good thing about the acts was they were all self-contained. Everybody had their little pieces of it. You're doing Fong singing Unforgettable, and you're doing the Dice Straits thing, and you're doing the this and the that. And people animated the shit out of that. <laughs> well, I did a breakdancing binome in that thing, and I, I don't know if I just did it. Something was happening, and then this binom finds himself in the spotlight, so he just has to do something, and then he starts busting out some moonwalking. The uh, bits I love in that, uh, the William Shatner, um, with the wig sliding off. And I think it's gonna be a, a long, long time. Big Andy with the Shatner stuff. Yeah, I did the Shatner. I animated the Shatner bit in that. I remember the primitives, and they were just a circle, a square, and a triangle that uh, we're playing. I was really resistant of Talent Night. It broke all of the conventions of, of the show. Like, Megabyte would never do that. And, you know, Bob would never do that. And it was making me angry and I couldn't let it go. And I, I remember talking to, to Gavin at how 
cross I was about it. And he was like, too bad. <laughs> so, there's these transforming speakers that come out of the ABCs. And that's like switched me to, okay, this is, I have something that's pretty cool in there. And then I saw some footage of, you know, the guitar duel. And I'm like, oh, okay, I understand what they're going for now. I was so wrong. I animated a lot of Megabyte in that. I remember putting the camera on the end of the guitar, watching a lot of Spinal Tap. There was a guy that worked at Mainframe, an animator, and he also was a guitar player. Mark Sheeman with the, the Megabyte guitar stuff, right? He was so proud of, because he played guitar, right? And he was super into that, and the fingering was all right. He set up his amplifier at one end of a hallway. I set up a microphone about 30 feet away. He turned it up to a thousand and just started started playing all this flashy stuff. As someone asked me at the convention, did you play the guitar? And I said, you're aware that it's an animated show. I did not play the guitar. I did say BFG. Glitch, BFG. Which stood for big freaking guitar. Is that what it stood for? Actually, you know what? Let's say Talent Light ended up being my favorite episode. <laughs> I did a long shot that was, uh, that had the YTV logo in it. It was just this long tracking shot that I think today would be a Wes Anderson shot, where we're just going along the stage, backstage, and it was all the characters who had been in the show, I think, to that point, just walking by. And I just threw in as many gags as I could, right, while I was putting this thing together, and that was super fun. Yeah. And then I think I ended it with the YTV robot spinning around. On behalf of YTV, I would like to extend our appreciation for the extraordinary YTV tribute in Talent Night in Hell. Not only was the show excellent and fun to watch, but wow is all we could utter when the humongous YTV robot icon came into full spectacular view, YTV logo and all. The icon was expertly and beautifully incorporated into the show and especially impressed our graphics department who created the robot. What a treat for YTVers and reboot fans. It felt like a lot of those pieces were given out to the animators specifically because of their skills. So. Uh, I can remember some of those pieces coming back and being able to, I didn't have to look at which animator had done it because their personalities were so present in all of those pieces that came back. Um, one of them was Dot singing Happy Birthday. And that was done by our only female animator, Michaela Zabranska. My name is Michaela Misha Zabranska and I was the first female animator and director on Reboot. I entered on TIFF, so I, I think that's episode like five or something, and I was given like a big chunk, uh, the opening scene, which is very conversational. It's all the three, it's uh, Dot, Enzo, and Bob. In that scene, there was the one when she gets upset with Enzo, and I took out the dialogue, and I just did like a very strong pose of like her being upset. And, and just tapping her finger, kind of like the female version of anger. No yelling, no talking, but I'm going to stare you down. <laughs> so like naturally, I, I did a lot of scenes with, with Dot and almost like developed a relationship with her. Dot had always been very much a fighter and, you know, warrior and very much square-shouldered. And suddenly she became this very slinky, sexy, character and nobody had moved her that way. A little playful uh, suggestion that there could be maybe something going on between Dot and Bob is the moment when they almost kiss or there's a suggestion they could and instead she slams him in the face. Yes, I came up with that. <laughs> Many of those young men had never even spoken to a real woman other than me. And so they didn't have a lot of understanding of how women move and how women think. Uh, but truthfully, that's how animators work. Animators work by getting reference and by moving their own bodies in the way that the characters are going to be moving. Michaela lived in a woman's body. It made sense for her to create that animation. She understood how it felt to walk in high heels, how it felt to try and walk down a runway like that. Um, she had very long legs too, just like Dot, so it was perfect. We would have like Japanese tourists coming through the office and taking pictures with me and everybody was just like, oh, she did the, she did the dot scene. <laughs>
my favorite binome, Johnny O. Binome, the, the binary comic <laughs> who told the, the joke in ones and zeros. Yeah, you have to be a software nerd to, to like that one. One oh one 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 oh one. But we actually had fans who, uh, who, were, who tried to figure out what the joke was. They were sure there was a joke, and there, there actually was a joke. It was uh, Take My Wife, Please, which is an old vaudeville joke. But it was just so ridiculous that there actually was a joke. <laughs> The day after that show aired, I went, I was out for a walk along the street and there were a couple of kids telling jokes to one another where the punchlines were zero and one. And I thought this is, you know, this show is now in the fabric here. I mean, when, when you start quoting the next day stuff like that, I mean, that's pretty esoteric stuff. Um, you know that it's, it's reaching a lot of people. We saw the viewing figures and, and we were, we were definitely competing in our time slot. Reboot had a fascinating number because it was equal boys and girls, which was something that was something that every company coveted. On a Saturday morning, we had about 1.1 million viewers on a Saturday morning for Reboot. Quite quickly down the line, we were beating the opposition, which was Fox, I think. We think they had like X-Men and things like that. And there was one weekend, I do remember one weekend where we beat X-Men and we were like, yes. Reboot became like the number one show, like a rocket, as I'd hoped, and it pulled everything. But I did a, a promotional trip to LA and I did like a, a little talk and showed clips and things. And we had a megabyte and a hexadecimal in costume. The reaction was very good, and it was turning heads because of what it was, you know, like you know, something people had never seen. There's a lot of different data points in figuring out whether a show's gonna work, but for me personally, as much as we had ratings data, um, I also had two kids who were right in that sweet spot of uh, reboot fandom. And I'll never forget taking them to school uh, and basically being mobbed by a bunch of their friends, all of whom wanted, who wanted to know uh, when the next reboot was coming out and what happens. And I got pulled over by the cops because they thought I was drunk and I wasn't. I was, I was just bopping to B.B. King, actually. And he went, where have you been? I went, I've just finished. We've been writing a script. He went, a script what for? And I went, for a TV show we weren't on. He went, what TV show? And I went, reboot. And he went, Guardian Bob? And I went, yes. And he went, oh, can you tell me what's happening in the next? And he, I had to tell him the plots of the next I think episode. the town really loved us. I was flying across Canada, which is important, and I ended up sitting in a row, and there was a woman next to me with two little kids, and they were playing with reboot action figures. And I said, oh, wow. And I, you know, it's a five hour flight, and after an hour, I was like, I gotta say something. So I said, um, by the way, I go, that's me. And she goes, what do you mean that's you? And I said, I'm, I'm Bob. She goes, like in a mall? Like a guy who dressed up in like a mall show? I was like, no, uh, I did the voice on the cartoon. And she's like, oh, she goes, we have to have you sign something. And I ended up signing a air sickness bag. And it did air in Britain, or at least the first couple of seasons. I do remember a lot of people writing to me, calling me, going, oh my God, I saw the show, sort of thing. So it did air over there. And the family saw it because I sent tapes. My mum would, you know, classic mum would, if it was in the paper, she'd cut out the story and save it for me and things like this. If it was in a magazine, she'd cut it out of the magazine. My family is very working class. It was my mum who supported me actually going away from home and doing a, a course that I think my dad couldn't understand what it was I was doing. He, up until he saw the first episode of Reboot on television, whenever he saw me, um, like on a weekend, I was home from London to visit. Um, he'd asked me how school was going. He couldn't understand what I was doing. He thought I was still learning to do something. It was being able to sit with him and mum and watch an entire episode of Reboot and, and then say, that's what I've been doing. All these years have led up to doing this. And he, he, he could understand what, what it was that we were trying to do. We, the hub, Ian, Phil, me, had a million things to do and a show to get produced. Every step of the process is, a, is a, a, an arm wrestle. I won't call it a battle, 
it's an arm wrestle between, but this is the way we do it on Saturday morning television. And us going, yeah, but we're not Saturday morning television. We want to do it like this. And I can see like in the early episodes, you hear those Hanna-Barbera sound effects, which we never wanted. And then you get like a few episodes in and they disappear because we won that battle. Sorry, arm wrestle. As we were getting to the end of season one, we were pretty much rolling. I wouldn't say it was a well-oiled machine quite yet, but we were getting there, we were hitting our targets. We had the breathing space between season one and season two. Once season two got going, we were, we had more directors, more suites, more animators, more lines of production going at the same time. And, and we'd really got it ticking along. When did you feel like making the show became a well-oiled machine? Bud Bob. Bud Bob. Bud Bob from start to finish was heaven.